Hello, this is Mash It and Smash It, but you can call me Mash or Mash It for short. You might be wondering what I'm doing in the belly of a giant space worm. Well, you see, the YouTube empire has been on the advance against creators after the rebel base of Vidme was forced to surrender. I wasn't able to save them in time. But I did manage to infiltrate the Imperial headquarters and steal some important blueprints for YouTube's next big project. I haven't looked at them yet, but I can tell this project is something big. Anyway, next thing I knew, a bunch of ships were coming after me, I fought them off, only to get swallowed by a giant worm, and here we are. I only wish I could have done something about Vidme. Their base is still up, but not for much longer. It will be shut down on December 15th. Hmm, that's interesting. It'll be shut down the same day the new Star Wars movie comes out. I wonder if there's a connection. I mean, Star Wars is now owned by Disney, who has been blocking all of my reviews of their movies without even looking at them first. I mean, sure, I managed to fight off all these claims, but they may have more tricks up their sleeves. There must be a connection to all this, and somehow, Star Wars is the key to figuring it all out. I mean, do I really need to go into detail with the cosmic force, pun not intended, that is Star Wars? One of the biggest franchises of all time? Inspired god knows how many modern works of media and endless references? Practically shaped the landscape of pop culture, ironically by borrowing elements from practically every big story that came before it? There's just no escaping it. Of course Disney bought it, because who else is even remotely big enough to contain a franchise as massive as this? Say what you will about George Lucas. No, seriously, it's all warranted. But he had a vision, and brought to life a modern mythology of the same caliber as comic book superheroes. Sure, he developed the tendency to ruin that mythology, but whatever, it's out of his hands now, like an abused child finally being moved to what should hopefully be a more caring foster home. I say hopefully because so far I wasn't a fan of Episode 7, and Rogue One was a guilty pleasure at best. But Episode 8 looks promising enough, so I'll give them the benefit of the doubt until I see it. And speaking of guilty pleasures, the prequels are still a big one for me. I mean, yes, I acknowledge their major issues, but I grew up with them. It also helps that while I did watch the original movies, I never truly got into them as a kid, so there was no comparison to be made with them when I saw the new stuff my young mind constantly craved. I think I was just the right age for each of them upon release. I was 10 when Episode 1 came out when I started to develop an interest for more mature action movies, but wasn't entirely ready to transition into darker, grittier stuff yet, so was accepting of something that is mostly bright and lighthearted fun with some occasional streaks of dark. 
When episode 2 came out, I was just entering the dark, brooding, angsty years of teenhood when I craved grittier things, but still had a small hint of childhood innocence. And then when episode 3 came out, I was all in on the angst at the age of 16, but also craving a little bit of character-driven drama, even if I didn't have the best idea yet what kinds of drama really hold up through the years. They were perfect for me, and even today, admittedly mostly due to a sentimental nostalgic attachment, I still enjoy popping these movies in for a Star Wars marathon every now and then. I can't even really bring myself to get annoyed by Jar Jar Binks, because he's become such an iconic staple for annoying characters that I find his stupid antics and horrible voice kind of charming in an ironic way. Still, continue to trash him all you want, because I know he deserves it. Of course, now that I've matured enough, nothing compares to the original trilogy. The first movie, while not the greatest movie ever, still holds up excellently today. Empire Strikes Back is easily one of the greatest films of all time, not much else to be said, and even Return to the Jedi, for all of its flaws, is still a very satisfying conclusion to the series. And here's hoping this series still has great movies to come. Who knows, we might even get the next masterpiece for the series, even though Empire is going to be a tough one for any movie to beat. Only time will tell. But I'm already about a page and a half into my script, and haven't even gotten to the main subject of this review yet. I guess when it comes to Star Wars, there's just that much to talk about, and I barely even scratched the surface of the movies I just discussed, or the overall expanded universe. There are so many different Star Wars related things to talk about, it's enough to make your head spin. Since it's December, as it has been for the last two years with each new release for the series, most people would opt to review the infamous Star Wars Holiday Special for the occasion. But like the rest of the series, everything that needed to be said about that one has been said. There's no point in subjecting myself to its horrors if it's already been picked apart by every online critic. Besides, I'm not ready to deviate from animated works just yet. So let's take this opportunity to talk about a cartoon series I've watched, Star Wars The Clone Wars. After I escape from this worm, how do I get out of here? Use the Force, smash it. Oh, of course, force my way out of here. That's not exactly what I meant. I'm out of the Doom Worm, that's all that matters. Clone Wars time! Created by our good friend George Lucas, and developed, written, and directed by Dave Filoni, who also directed the first season of Avatar The Last Airbender, the series premiered on August of 2008 with a pilot movie actually being released in theaters. To not so great reception. Now, I actually enjoy the movie fine for what it is, but when I saw it in the theater, I couldn't deny that what I was watching did not feel like a proper movie worthy of cinemas, but rather an hour and a half long TV pilot. Or, to be more specific, a three part pilot with each part feeling like a different episode. It was an awkward experience. Not helped by the fact that the film suddenly got messed up and the audience had to wait an hour or so before we moved to another auditorium that was also playing the movie. Yes, that is a real event that happened to me. But since the movie was theatrically released, that means it qualifies for my animated movie review series, so I'll have to save a proper review of it for later. For now, let's focus on the main series. The Clone Wars have spread throughout the galaxy, as the Jedi fight an ongoing conflict against the Separatists, led by Count Dooku. <laughs> Anakin Skywalker, now a Jedi Knight, is charged with the responsibility of training a new Padawan apprentice, Ahsoka Tano. As they and other Jedi face a variety of foes in a variety of battles, they work to restore balance to the Force. And that's the best I can do to summarize this series, because overall, there's no true focus to the story. Sure, the Clone Wars are the overarching plot to everything that happens, but every episode is a completely different story, each focusing on a different protagonist. And for a series like this, that idea makes perfect sense. 
I mean, a massive intergalactic war like the one portrayed here wouldn't be a single straightforward plot of one hero, but rather a series of branching storylines, each with their own separate backgrounds and heroes. Granted, the vast majority of stories in this show still focus on Anakin, Ahsoka, and Obi-Wan, but it still never shies from involving characters that are both new and familiar, and sometimes a bit of both, to the Star Wars universe. And sometimes, these characters end up being the protagonists of their respective episodes. It's the perfect sci-fi portrayal of just what kinds of stories branch out from a single war. The CG animation is good in a blocky sort of way. Everything moves smoothly and naturally, and the action scenes are very well choreographed. Though I'd be lying if I said the character designs don't look a little weird at times. I mean, Obi-Wan's hair literally looks like a carefully carved block of wood was placed on his head. But you get used to it, and over time, you may learn to appreciate the unique art style. And is there anything to say about the setting that doesn't speak for itself? It's Star Wars. There are hundreds of books dedicated to establishing the lore of this universe. Middle Earth's got nothing on this. All I can say about it is that it gives you the exact same experience as you get from it in the movies, if not even more due to how many planets are visited throughout the series. And then we have the many, many characters that make up the cast. Way more than I have time to talk about. Of course we have the familiar ones like Yoda, R2-D2, C-3PO, and Chancellor Palpatine, who are all as you remember them, with some opportunities to be expanded on. And even Jar Jar, even Jar Jar, becomes less of a migraine and starts becoming more useful and even semi-likable. Semi-likable. And then we have characters, specifically Jedi, who served more as background characters in the movies. Here, they're fleshed out more, and we get to know them a little better. Granted, none of them are super interesting. They mostly have the same kind of honorable determination, which I will admit gets a little monotonous character-wise. But at the same time, they all manage to be likable enough, and you do care about what happens to them. Which makes Order 66 a little harder to watch. Of course, this war wouldn't be complete without our future Darth Vader, Anakin Skywalker, who, believe it or not, is actually the version of the character that people may have envisioned from all of Obi-Wan's stories of him in the original trilogy. He's a very competent Jedi, but sometimes can get a little cocky and do things a little out of line in order to get the job done. In other words, he's an actual character. None of this whiny, angsty, I don't like sand crap. He is the actual badass that the future Darth Vader was meant to be. It's almost jarring how much different he is in this show to the Hayden Christensen version. Even his scenes with Padme, who's also greatly improved from the movies, show a lot more chemistry between this couple. It's not great or anything, but I do find myself caring about their relationship now and then. Obi-Wan makes for a great foil to Anakin, with his straight-laced persona working off of his apprentice's fieriness, all while keeping a rather dry sense of humor. Despite not getting his hands dirty as much as Anakin does, he still takes plenty of opportunities to show off his power as well. I mean, he is the same guy who will one day show his apprentice's son the ropes, so you can't expect anything less. Definitely one of the most interesting characters in the show, with voice actor James Arnold Taylor giving a solid impression of Ewan McGregor, who in turn did a solid channeling of Sir Alec Guinness. As for Ahsoka, I hear a lot of people refer to her as a Mary Sue. I never really got that impression. Sure, she's a teenage girl being inserted into a story out of nowhere, like you would normally see from such characters, but it's not like she's really that overpowered. She mostly comes off as a humble Padawan who gradually learns the tricks of being a Jedi and manages to hold her own against certain foes. I suppose this is more than you would expect from a youngling, but keep in mind that her master is Anakin freaking Skywalker. Hayden Christensen or not, there's no denying his abilities and how much he can pass down to this girl. While I would definitely say that there was no need to have this character, and that this is clearly pandering to the demographic watching this show, Ahsoka still manages to be fairly likable. And without giving too much away, 
Her inevitable send-off is some of the best writing the show has to offer. Not bad for a Kid Appeal character. And of course, it ain't Star Wars without some Sith Lords to deal with. Count Dooku <laughs> gives us plenty of what the late great Christopher Lee could have used more of in the movies. You know, where he had one cool fight scene with Yoda and then got killed near the very beginning of the next movie. His presence never falters, his badass moments are too many to count, and Corey Burton does an excellent job filling in for Lee. Other villains include the return of the imposing yet unsophisticated General Grievous, the mysterious and complex Asajj Ventress, and the super badass bounty hunter Cad Bane, before the other badass bounty hunter who takes his place later in the timeline, only to disappoint. And we even get some memorable and entertaining side antagonists like Hondo Onaka, and a certain villain from one of the prequels who people believe deserved more than he got may make an appearance down the line. So that's at least six memorable villains in this series. But interestingly enough, my favorite characters of the show are the Clone Troopers. Yeah, despite all being identical in almost every way physically, save for various hairstyles, each clone is like his own character, and they all have plenty of opportunities for some character development. There are even episodes focused on various members of this army, and we get to know each of them. Granted, I can't really remember most of their names or how to distinguish them, but that's okay because all of them are very likable. And since they're the main soldiers fighting with the good guys, it only makes sense that we get to know them more, so that we can understand the stakes of this war a little better. For once, when we see these proto-stormtroopers get shot down, we actually feel something. And D. Bradley Baker does such a good job not only channeling the accent of the Fets, but also giving them such depth and emotion. This just goes to show that not all great heroes in this series have to wield a lightsaber. Also props to the music. Kevin Kinner fills in for John Williams, and he does an excellent job channeling the overall style and emotion of the film's compositions. This series is packed with story arcs, which I'll admit, can be pretty hit and miss at times. Don't get me wrong, when this show gets good, it gets really good, but there are also plenty of episodes that are... kinda boring. Some story arcs have very simple black and white scenarios with generic villains and even more generic morals. And while the action scenes never falter, some conflicts in this show are just more memorable than others. It rarely, if ever, gets straight up bad, but some episodes just don't manage to get me that invested. But again, there are plenty of definite highlights, and some of the show's best episodes are near the very end. So long as your attention span isn't too short, the dull episodes are worth getting through for the really good ones, and you should be entertained enough throughout to be willing to stick with the show until the end. So do I consider this show one of my absolute favorites? Not really. Maybe it's because I'm a little more drawn to shows with a quicker pace and just a little more personality than this show has. But for what it is, it's still quite solid. I think it's safe to say that this show is very much superior to any of the prequels. And I can't really get angry at a show for simply getting a little dull at times, when it still has plenty of awesome sci-fi action. For that, I'm giving Star Wars The Clone Wars an 8 out of 10. In the end, the Force is strong with this show. Well, with that out of the way, I guess it's time to see those blueprints. Security Breach Who's there? <sighs> you Hand over the blueprints NEVER! You are beaten it is useless to resist. Don't let yourself be destroyed as Vidmi did. Mash it. You do not yet realize your importance. You've only begun to discover your video-making abilities. Join me, and I will complete your business plans. With our combined strength, we can end this destructive apocalypse and bring order to the internet. 
I'll never join you! You destroyed my aspirations! No. I am your aspirations. No. No. That's not true! That's impossible! Search your feelings. You know it to be true. No! No! Mash it. You can break you two. It has foreseen this. It is your destiny. Join me, and together we can rule the internet as the greatest YouTube channel of all time. Okay, now you're just buttering me up. True, but you bought it for a moment, right? Look, I'm just gonna let go and fall to my death, okay? Tell Tennille Flowers I hate her! Fine. Be that way. What? Whew! I survived. Remember, kids, when falling to the ground all the way from the orbit of space, always remember to keep your arms and legs locked in an upright position. Of course, it helps that I don't even have arms or legs. The previous statement was intended for satire and should not be attempted by anyone. Do not attempt to fall to Earth from space, as there is no possible way to survive a fall of such a distance, no matter whether or not one has limbs or what position they are in. Furthermore, it would be unwise to enter the vacuum of space without proper space equipment, including a fully oxygenated spacesuit and helmet. Otherwise, this should be common knowledge to anyone who is not a complete idiot like Mr. Mashin and Smash appears to be. Hey, I heard that. What now? I lost the blueprints and have no idea what YouTube's planning, or how it connects with the new Star Wars movie or the shutting down of Vidme. There must be other things I can talk about. There is another! Clone Wars! That's right! The Clone Wars miniseries by Gendy Tartakovsky. I forgot about that one. Well, perhaps another time. Same goes for the follow-up to THE Clone Wars, Star Wars Rebels. But for now, I think it's about time to put on my holiday spirit. Call me you do! Holiday spirit. Apologies! What they used to be, my figures are not. Anyway, tune in next time as I review a Christmas special from my childhood. Until then, this is Mash It and Smash It, signing off. <laughs>